Welcome to CS224N uh, Lecture 17, uh, Model Analysis and Explanation. OK, look at us. We're here. Um, uh, let's start with some course logistics. Um, we have uh, updated the policy on the guest lecture reactions. Um, they're all due Friday, um, all at 11.59 PM. You can't use late days for this. Uh, so please get them in. Um, watch the lectures. They're awesome lectures. They're awesome guests. Um, and you get something like half a point for each of them. And yeah, all three can be submitted up through Friday. Um, OK, so uh, final projects. Remember that the due date is Tuesday. It's Tuesday at 4.30 PM, uh, March 16th. And uh, let me uh, emphasize that there's a hard deadline on the three days from then, um, Friday. Uh, we won't be accepting for additional points off uh, assignments, uh, sorry, final projects that are submitted after the uh, 4.30 deadline on Friday. Uh, we need to get these graded uh, and get grades in. So um, whew, it's the end stretch, week nine. Our week 10 is really the lectures are uh, us giving you help on the final projects. So, so this is really the last week of lectures. Thanks for all your hard work um, and for uh, asking awesome questions in lecture and in office hours and on ed. And uh, let's, get, let's get right into it. So um, today, we get to talk about one of my favorite subjects in natural language processing. It's model analysis and explanation. Um, so first, we're going to do what I love doing, which is motivating why we want to talk about the topic at all. Uh, we'll talk about how you know, we can look at a model at different levels of abstraction to perform different kinds of analysis on it. Um, we'll talk about out-of-domain evaluation sets. So this will feel familiar to the, uh, to the robust QA folks. Um, then uh, we'll talk about uh, sort of trying to figure out for a given example, why did it make the decision that it made? It had some input, it produced some output. Can we come up with some sort of interpretable explanation for it? And um, then we'll look at actually the representations of the models. So these are the sort of hidden states, the vectors that are being built you know, throughout the processing of the model, try to figure out if we can understand some of the uh, representations and mechanisms that the model is performing. And then we'll actually come back to sort of one of the kind of default states that we've been in in this course, which is trying to you know, look at model improvements, removing things from models, seeing how it performs, and relate that to the analysis that we're doing in this lecture, show how it's not all all that different. Uh, OK. Um, so uh, if you haven't seen this XKCD, um, now you have. And it's one of my favorites. I'm going to say all the words. So uh, person A says, this is your machine learning system. Uh, person B says, yup. You pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, and then collect the answers on the other side. Person A, what if the answers are wrong? Then person B, just stir the pile until they start looking right. Um, and I feel like, at its worst, uh, deep learning can feel like this from time to time. You have a model. Maybe it works for some things. Maybe it doesn't work for other things. You're, you're not sure why it works for some things and doesn't work for others. And you know, the changes that we make to our models, um, you know, they're based on intuition. But frequently, you know, what are the TAs told? You know, everyone in office hours is like, ah, sometimes you just have to try it and see if it's going to work out, because it's very hard to tell. Um, it's very, very difficult. Uh, to understand our models on sort of any level. And so today we'll go through a number of ways for trying to sort of carve out little bits of understanding here and there. Um, so so uh, beyond it being you know, important because it's in the XKCD comic, um, what, why should we care about what our models, uh, about understanding our models? One is that we want to know um, what our models are doing. Uh, so here you have a black box. Black box functions are sort of this idea that you can't look into them and interpret what they're doing. Um, you have an input sentence, say, and then some output prediction. Maybe this black box is actually your, uh, your final project uh, model. And it gets some accuracy. Now, we summarize our models. And in your final projects, you'll summarize your model with sort of one or a handful of of summary metrics of accuracy or F1 score or blue score or something. Um, but 
it's a lot of model to explain with just a small number of, of metrics. So what do they learn? Why do they succeed? And, and why do they fail? Um, what's another motivation? So we want, to, we want to sort of know what our models are doing. OK. But, but uh, maybe that's because we want to be able to make tomorrow's model. So today, right, when you're building models in this class at a company, you, know, you start out with some kind of recipe that is known to work either at the company or because you have experience from this class. Um, and it's not perfect, right? It, it makes mistakes. You look at the errors. And then over time, you, know, you take what works, maybe, you, <laughs> and then you, you find what needs changing. So it seems like maybe you know, adding another layer to the model <laughs> helped. Uh, and maybe that's, that's a nice tweak, and the model performance gets better, et cetera. And um, you know, incremental progress uh, doesn't always feel exciting, but I want to pitch to you that it's actually very important for us to understand how much incremental progress can kind of get us towards some of our goals so that we can have a better job of evaluating when we, ne when we need big leaps, when we need major changes, because there are problems that we're attacking with our incremental sort of progress and we're not getting very far. OK, so we want to make tomorrow's model. Um, another thing that is, I think, very related to and sort of a, both a part of and bigger than uh, this field of analysis is model biases. So let's say you take your word to vec uh, analogies solver you know, from, um, from Glove, or word to vec that is from assignment one, and you give it the, the analogy, man is to computer programmer as woman is to, and it gives you the output homemaker. This is a real example from the paper uh, below. Um, you should be like, wow, well, uh, I'm glad I know that now. And of course, you saw the lecture from uh, Yulia uh, Svetkov um, last week, you say, wow, I'm glad I know that now. And that's a, that's a huge problem. What did the model use in its decision? What biases is it learning from data and possibly making even worse? So that's the kind of thing that you can also do with model analysis beyond just making models better according to some sort of summary metric um, as well. And then another thing, we don't just want to make tomorrow's model. And this is something that I think is super important. Uh, we, we, you know, we don't just want to look at that time scale. We want to say, what about 10, 15, 25 years from now? What kinds of things will we be doing? You know, what are the limits? What can be learned by language uh, model pre-training? What what's the model that will replace the transformer? Uh, what's the model that will replace that model? Um, what does deep learning struggle to do? What are we sort of attacking over and over again and failing to make significant progress on? What do neural models tell us about language potentially? There are some people who are primarily interested in understanding language better using neural networks. Cool. Um, how, are, uh, how are our models affecting people? Transferring power between groups of people, governments, et cetera. That's an excellent type of analysis. What can't be learned via language model pre-training? So that's sort of the complementary question there. If you sort of come to the edge of what you can learn via language model pre-training, is there stuff that we need total paradigm shifts in order to, to, uh, to do well? So all of this, I mean, you know, falls under some category of trying to really deeply understand our models and their capabilities. And uh, there's a lot of different methods here that we'll go over today. And uh, one thing that I want you to take away from it is that they're all, they're all going to tell us um, some aspect of the model elucidates some kind of intuition or something, but none of them are, are we going to say, aha, I really understand 100% about what this model is doing now. Um, so they're going to provide some clarity, but never total clarity. And uh, one way, if you're trying to decide how you want to understand your model more, that I think you should sort of start out by thinking about is, at what level of abstraction do I want to be uh, looking at my model? So the sort of very high level abstraction, let's say you've trained you know, uh, a, a QA model to estimate the probabilities of start and end indices in, you know, in a reading comprehension problem, or you've trained a language model that assigns probabilities to words in context. You can just look at the model as that object. So it's just a probability distribution defined by your model. You are not looking into it any further than the fact that you can sort of give it inputs and see what outputs it provides. Um, uh, so that's like not even, who, who even cares if it's a neural network? It could be anything. Um, but it's a way to understand its behavior. 
Another level of abstraction that you can look at, you can get, dig a little deeper. You can say, well, I know that my network is a bunch of layers that are kind of stacked on top of each other. You've got sort of maybe your transformer encoder with your know, one layer, two layer, three layer. You can try to see what it's doing as it goes deeper in the layers. So maybe your neural model is a sequence of these vector representations. A third option of sort of specificity is to look, you know, as much as, as, at as much detail as you can. You've got these parameters in there. You've got the connections in the computation graph. Um, so now you're sort of trying to remove all of the uh, abstraction that you can and look at as many details as possible. And all three of these sort of ways of looking at your model and performing analysis are going to be useful and will actually sort of travel slowly from one to two to three as we go through this lecture. Okay, so we haven't actually talked about any analyses yet, uh, uh, so we're going to get started on that on that now. Um, and uh, we're starting with the sort of testing our model's behaviors. So would we want to see, will my model perform well? I mean, the, the natural thing to ask is, well, how does it behave on some, on some sort of uh, test set? Right? And so uh, we don't really care about mechanisms yet. Why is it performing this? By what method is it making its decision? Instead, we're just interested in sort of the more higher level abstraction uh, of like, does it perform the way I want it to perform? So, so let's like took our, take our model evaluation that we are already doing and sort of recast it in the framework of, a, of analysis. So you've trained your model on some samples uh, from some distribution. So you've got input output pairs of some kind. Um, so how does the model behave on samples from the same distribution? It's a simple question, and it's sort of, uh, you know, it's known as, you know, in-domain accuracy, or uh, you can say that the samples are IID, and that's what you're testing on. And this is just what we've been doing this whole time. It's your test set accuracy, or F1, or blue score. And, you know, um, so you've got some model with some accuracy, and uh, maybe it's better than some model with some other accuracy on this test set, right? So this is what you're doing as you're iterating on your models in your final project as well. Um, you say, well, you know, on my test set, which is what I've decided to care about for now, model A does better. They both seem pretty good. Uh, and so maybe I'll choose model A to keep working on. Maybe I'll choose it if you were putting something into production. Um, but remember back to, you know, this, this idea that it's just one number to summarize a very complex system. Uh, it's not going to be sufficient to tell you how it's going to perform in a wide variety of settings. Okay, so, so we've been doing this. This is model evaluation as model analysis. Um, now we are going to say, what if we are not testing on exactly the same type of data that we trained on? So now we're asking, did the model learn something such that it's able to sort of extrapolate or perform uh, how I want it to on data that looks a little bit different from what it was trained on? And we're going to take the example of natural language inference. So to recall the task of natural language inference, and this is through the multi-NLI data set that we're just pulling our definition. Uh, you have a premise. He turned and saw John sleeping in his half tent. And you have a hypothesis. He saw John was asleep. And then you give them both to a model. Um, and this is the model that we had before that gets some good accuracy. And the model is supposed to tell whether um, the hypothesis is sort of implied by the premise or contradicting. Um, so it could be contradicting, maybe if the hypothesis is, you know, John was awake, for example, or he saw John was awake, maybe that would be a contradiction. Neutral, if um, sort of both could be true at the same time, so to speak. And then entailment, in this case, you know, it seems like they're saying that, you know, the premise implies the hypothesis. And so, uh, you know, you would say probably this is likely to get the right answer since the accuracy of the model is 95%. 95% of the time it gets the right answer. Um, and we're going to dig deeper into that. Uh, what if the model is not doing what we think we want it to be doing in order to perform natural language inference? So in a data set like multi-NLI, the authors who gathered the data set will have asked humans to perform the task and you know, gotten the accuracy that the humans uh, achieved. And models nowadays are achieving accuracies that are around where humans are achieving, um, which sounds great at first. <laughs> Uh, but it, as we'll see, it's not the same as actually performing the, uh, the task more broadly in the right way. So what if the model's not doing something smart effectively? Um, we're going to use a diagnostic test set 
of carefully constructed examples that seem like things the model should be able to do to test for a specific skill or capacity. And in this case, we'll use Hans. So Hans is the heuristic analysis for analyzed systems uh, data set. And um, it's intended to take systems that do natural language inference and test whether they're, they're using some simple syntactic heuristics. What we'll have in each of these cases, we'll have some heuristic. Uh, we'll talk through the definition. We'll get an example. So the first thing is lexical overlap. So uh, the model might do this thing where it assumes that a premise entails all hypotheses constructed from words in the premise. So in this example, you have um, the premise the doctor was paid by the actor. And then the hypothesis is the doctor paid the actor. And you'll notice that in bold here, get the doctor, OK, and then paid, and then the actor. Right, and so if you use this, uh, this heuristic, you will think that the doctor was paid by the actor implies the doctor paid the actor. That does not imply it, of course. Uh, and so you, know, you could expect a model. You want the model to be able to do this. It's somewhat simple. Uh, but if it's using this heuristic, it won't get this example right. Next is uh, subsequence uh, heuristics. So here, if the, if the model assumes that the premise entails all of its contiguous subsequences, it will get this one wrong as well. So the example is the doctor near the actor danced. That's the premise. The hypothesis is the actor danced. Now, this is a simple syntactic thing. The doctor is doing the dancing near the actor is this prepositional phrase. Uh, and so the model sort of uses this heuristic, oh, look, the actor danced. That's a subsequence entailed. Awesome. Then it'll get this one wrong as well. And um, here's another one that's a lot like subsequence. But uh, so if, if the premise, uh, if the model thinks that the premise entails all complete subtrees, so this is like sort of fully formed phrases. So the artist slept here is a fully formed sort of, is a subtree. If the artist slept, the actor ran. And then that's the premise. Does it entail the hypothesis the actor slept? Uh, no. Uh, sorry, the artist slept. Uh, that does not entail it because this is in that conditional. OK, let me pause here for some questions before I uh, move on to see how these models do. Uh, anyone unclear about uh, how this sort of evaluation is being set up? OK, Okay. so um, so how do models perform? That's sort of the question of the hour. Um, what we'll do is uh, you know, we'll look at these results from the same paper that re released the data set. So they took four strong multi-NLI models um, uh, with the following accuracies. So the accuracies here are something between 60 and 80-something, you know, 80%. 80 Bert over here is doing the best. OK. And, um, in domain, right, in that first sort of setting that we talked about, uh, you get these reasonable accuracies. And um, that is sort of what we said before about it, like, looking pretty good. And when we evaluate on Hans, in this setting here, we have examples where the heuristics we talked about actually work. So if the model is using the heuristic, it will get this right. And it gets <laughs> very high accuracies. And then uh, if we evaluate the model in the settings where if it uses the heuristic, it gets the examples wrong, um, you know, maybe Bert's doing like epsilon better than some of the other stuff here. But it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a very different story. Okay? And, and you saw those examples. They're not complex in our sort of own idea of complexity. Uh, and so this is why it sort of feels like a clear failure of the system. Now, you can say, though, that, well, maybe the training data sort of wasn't, didn't have any of those sort of phenomena, so the model couldn't have learned uh, not to do that. And that's sort of a reasonable argument, except, well, you know, BERT is pre-trained on a bunch of language texts, so you might hope, you might expect, you might hope that it does better. OK, so, so we saw that example of... Um, models performing well on examples that are like those that it was trained on, and then performing not very well at all on examples that seem reasonable uh, but are um, sort of uh, a little bit tricky. Now we're going to take this idea of 
having a test set that we've carefully crafted and go in a slightly different direction. So we're going to have, what does it mean to try to understand the linguistic properties of our models? Does it, so that syntactic heuristics question was one thing for natural language inference, but can we sort of test how the models, whether they think certain things are sort of right or wrong uh, as language models? Uh, and the first way, way that we'll do this is we'll ask, well, how do we think about sort of what humans think of as good uh, language? How do we evaluate uh, their sort of preferences about language? Um, and one answer is minimal pairs. And the idea of a minimal pair is that you've got one sentence that sounds OK to a speaker. So this sentence is, the chef who made the pizzas is here. It's called, it's an acceptable sentence, at least to me. Um, and then with a small change, a minimal change, um, uh, the, the sentence is no longer OK to the speaker. So the chef who made the pizzas are here. And um, uh, this, um, whoops, this should be present tense verbs. Uh, <laughs> in English, present tense verbs agree in number with their subject uh, when they are third person. Um, so chef, pizzas, OK. Um, and. Um, uh, this is sort of a pretty general thing. Most people don't like this. It's a misconjugated verb. Um, and so the, the syntax here looks like you have the chef who made the pizzas. And then uh, this arc of agreement and number is requiring uh, the word is here to be singular is instead of plural are, despite the fact that there's this, ver this noun pizzas, which is plural, closer linearly. Comes back to dependency parsing. We're back. OK. Um, and what this, this looks like in the tree structure, right, is, well, you know, chef and is um, are attached in the tree. Um, <laughs> you know, chef is the subject of is. Pizzas is down here in this subtree. And so that subject-verb relationship has this sort of agreement uh, thing. So um, this is a pretty sort of basic and interesting property of language that also reflects the syntactic sort of hierarchical structure of language. So we've been training these language models, sampling from them, seeing that they get interesting things. And they tend to seem to generate syntactic content. Uh, but does it really understand, or does it behave as if it understands this idea of agreement more broadly? And does it sort of get the syntax right so that it matches the subjects and the verbs? Um, so, but language models can't tell us exactly whether they think that a sentence is good or bad. They just tell us the probability of a sentence. Uh, so um, before we had acceptable and unacceptable, that's what we get from humans. Um, and the language model's analog is just, does it assign higher probability to the acceptable sentence in the minimal pair, right? So you have the probability under the model of um, the chef who made the, made the pizzas is here, and then you have the probability under the model of the chef who made the, made the pizzas are here. And you want this probability here to be uh, higher. Um, and if it is, that's sort of like a, a simple way to test whether the model like, got it right effectively. Um, and um, just like in Hans, we can develop a test set with very carefully chosen properties, right? So most sentences in English don't have terribly complex um, subject verb agreement structure with a lot of words in the middle like pizzas that are going to make it difficult. So if I say, you know, um, the dog runs, sort of no way to get it wrong because there's no, <laughs> the syntax is very simple. Um, so we can create uh, or we can look for sentences that have these the things called attractors uh, in uh, the sentence. So pizzas is an attractor because the model might be attracted to the plurality here and get the conjugation wrong. Um, so this is our question. Can language models sort of very generally handle these examples with attractors. So we can take examples with zero attractors, see whether the model gets the minimal pairs evaluation right. We can take examples with one attractor, two attractors. You can see how people would still reasonably understand these sentences, right? The chef who made the pizzas and prepped the ingredients is. It's still the chef who is. And then, you know, on and on and on. It gets rarer, obviously, but, but you can have more and more attractors. And so now we've created this test set that's intended to evaluate this very specific linguistic phenomenon. Um, so in this paper here, uh, Concur et al. Um, trained an LSTM language model on a subset of Wikipedia. 
uh, back in 2018. And um, they evaluate it sort of in these buckets that are specified by uh, the paper um, that sort of introduced subject verb agreement to, uh, to the NLP field, or more recently at least. Um, and they evaluate it in buckets based on the number of attractors. And so uh, in this table here that you're about to see, the, um, the numbers are sort of the percent of times that you get this assigned higher probability to the correct uh, sentence in the minimal pair. Uh, so if you were just to do random or majority class, you get these errors. Oh, sorry, it's the percent of times that you get it wrong. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so lower is better. Um, and so with no attractors, you get very low error rates. So this is 1.3 error rate with a 350-dimensional LSTM. Um, and uh, you know, with, uh, with one attractor, your error rate is higher. But actually, humans start to get errors with more attractors, too. Um, so zero attractors is easy. Uh, the larger the LSTM, it looks like, in general, the better you're doing. right? So the smaller model's doing worse, OK? Um, and then even on sort of very difficult examples with four attractors, which you try to think of an example in your head, like the chef made the pizzas and took out the trash, and, you know, it sort of has to be this long sentence. Um, the error rate is definitely higher, so it gets more difficult. Um, but it's still, it's still relatively low. And so even on these very hard examples, models are actually performing subject-verb-number agreement relatively well. Very cool. OK. Uh, here are some examples that uh, a model got wrong. This is actually a worse model than the ones from the paper that was just there. But I think, actually, the errors are quite interesting. Um, so here's a sentence. The ship that the player drives has a very high speed. Now, this model thought that was less probable than the ship that the player drives have a very high speed. Um, my hypothesis right, is that it sort of misanalyzes drives as a plural noun, for example. It's sort of a difficult construction there. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, likewise here, this one is, so, is, is fun. Uh, the lead is also rather long. Five paragraphs is pretty lengthy. Um, so here, five paragraphs is a singular noun together. because It's like a unit of length, I guess. Um, but, <laughs> but the model thought that it was more likely to say five paragraphs are pretty lengthy um, because it's referring to this sort of five paragraphs as the five actual paragraphs themselves as opposed to a single unit of length describing the lead. Fascinating. OK. Um, maybe questions again? Uh. Um, so I guess there are a couple. Can we do the similar heuristic analysis for other tasks, such as Q&A, classification? Yes. Um, so yes, I think that it's easier to do this kind of analysis for like the Hans style analysis with uh, with question answering um, and other other sorts of tasks because you can construct examples that similarly uh, you know have these heuristics um, uh, and then have the answer depend on the syntax or not. You know the actual probability of one sentence is higher than the other, of course, is sort of a language model dependent thing. But um, the idea that you can sort of like de develop kind of bespoke test sets for various tasks, um, I think is very, very general and um, something I think is actually quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, yes, so I won't, I won't go on further, but I think the answer is just yes. So, so there's another one. Um, how do you know where to find these failure cases? Maybe that's the right time to advertise linguistics classes. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you're still very quiet was, over here. How do you find was, what? How do you know where to find these failure cases? Oh, interesting, yes. How do we know where to find the failure cases? That's a good question. I mean, I think I agree with Chris that actually, you know, thinking about what is... Uh, interesting about things in language is one way to do it. I mean, the kind of the heuristics that we saw um, 
in our language model, sorry, in our uh, NLI models with Hans, um, you can kind of imagine that they, uh, if the model was sort of ignoring facts about language and sort of just doing this sort of rough bag of words with some extra magic, then it would do well about as bad as it's doing here. And these sorts of ideas about, um, you know, understanding that this statement, if the artist slept, the actor ran, does not imply the artist slept, is the kind of thing that um, maybe you'd think up on your own, but also you'd spend time sort of pondering about and, and, and thinking broad thoughts about in, uh, in you know, linguistics uh, curricula as well. So, uh, Anything else, Chris? Um, so there's also... Well, I guess someone was also saying, I think it's about the sort of intervening verbs example, or intervening noun, sorry, example. But the data set, the data set itself probably includes mistakes with higher attractors. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, because humans make more and more mistakes as the number of attractors gets larger. Um, on the other hand, I think that the mistakes are fewer in written text than in spoken. Maybe I'm just making that up, but that's what I think. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to actually go through that test set and see uh, <laughs> uh, how many of the errors a really strong model makes are actually due to the sort of observed form being incorrect. I'd, I'd be super curious. Okay, should I move on? Yep. Great. Uh, okay. So, um, so, so, what does it feel like we're doing when we are kind of constructing these sort of bespoke, small, careful test sets for various uh, phenomena? Well, it it sort of feels like unit testing. Um, and in fact, this sort of idea has been um, uh, uh, brought, in, brought to the fore, you might say, in NLP um, unit tests, but for these NLP neural networks. And in particular, uh, the paper here that I'm citing at the bottom suggests this minimal function, minimum functionality test. You want a small test set that targets a specific behavior that should sound like some of the things that, we were, uh, that we've already talked about. But in this case, um, we're going to get even more specific. So here's a single test case. We're going to have an expected label, what was actually predicted, whether the model passed this unit test. And um, the labels are going to, be, going to be sentiment analysis here. So negative label, positive label, or neutral are the three options. Um, and the unit test is going to consist simply of uh, sentences that follow this template. I, and then a negation and a positive verb, and then the thing. So if you, if you negation positive verb, it means you negative verb, right? And so here's an example. I can't say I recommend the food. The expected label is negative. The answer that the model provided, and this is, I think, a commercial uh, sentiment analysis system. Uh, was pos so it predicted positive. And then I didn't love the flight. It, uh, the expected label was negative. And then the predicted answer was uh, neutral. And this set commercial sentiment analysis system gets a lot of what well, you could imagine are pretty reasonably simple examples wrong. And so um, what your Bureau at all 2020 showed is that they could actually provide a system um, that sort of had this framework of building test cases for NLP models to ML engineers working on these products um, and uh, give them that interface and, and they would actually find bugs you know, bugs being categories of high error, right? Find bugs in their models that they could then kind of try to go and fix. Um, and that this was kind of an efficient way of trying to find things that were simple and still wrong with what should be pretty, pretty sophisticated neural systems. Um, so I, th I really like this, and uh, it's sort of a nice way of thinking more specifically about what are the capabilities um, in, in sort of precise terms of our models. And all together now, you've seen problems in uh, natural language inference. You've seen language models actually perform pretty well at the language modeling objective. But then you see, uh, you just saw an example of a 
commercial sentiment analysis system that sort of should do better and doesn't. And um, this comes to this really, I think, broad and important takeaway, which is uh, if you get high accuracy on the in-domain test set, uh, you are not guaranteed high accuracy on um, even what you might consider to be reasonable out-of-domain uh, evaluations. And life is always out of domain. <laughs> uh, and if you're building a system that will be uh, uh, given to users, uh, it's immediately out of domain, at the very least because it's trained on text that's now older than the things that the users are now saying. So it's a really, really important takeaway that your sort of benchmark accuracy is a single number that does not guarantee good performance on a wide variety of things. And from a what are our neural networks doing perspective, uh, one way to think about it is that models seem to be learning the data set fitting sort of the fine-grained sort of heuristics and statistics that help it uh, fit this one data set, as opposed to learning the task. So humans can perform natural language inference. If you give them examples from whatever data set, um, you know, once you've told them how to do the task, they'll be very generally um, strong at it. But you take your MNLI uh, <laughs> model and you test it on Hans, and it got, you know, whatever that was, below chance accuracy. That's not the kind of thing that you want to see. So it definitely learns the data set well because the accuracy in domain is high. Um, but uh, our models are seemingly not frequently learning uh, sort of the mechanisms <laughs> that we would like them to be learning. Last week, we heard about language models and sort of the implicit knowledge that they encode about the world through pre-training. And one of the ways that we saw to interact with language models was providing them with a prompt, like Dante was born in mask, and then seeing if it puts high probability on the correct continuation, which requires you to access knowledge about where Dante was born. And we didn't frame it this way last week, uh, but this fits into the set of behavioral studies that we've done so far. This is a specific kind of input. You could ask this for multiple types of for multiple people. You could swap out Dante for other people. You could swap out born in for, I don't know, died in or something. Um, and then you can, there are like test suites again. And so um, it's all connected. OK, so I won't go too deep into sort of the knowledge uh, of language models in terms of world knowledge because we've uh, gone over it some. But you know, when you're thinking about ways of interacting with your models, um, this sort of behavioral study can be very, very general. Even though, remember, we're at still this highest level of abstraction uh, where we're just looking at the probability distributions that are defined. All right. So now we'll go into, so we've sort of looked at understanding in, in fine-grained areas what our model is actually doing. Um, uh, what about sort of why for an individual input is it getting the answer right or wrong? And then are there changes to the inputs that uh, look fine to humans but actually make the models uh, do a bad job? So one study that I love to, to reference that really draws back into our, our original motivation of using LSTM uh, networks instead of simple recurrent neural networks was that they could use long context. Um, so, um, but like how long is your long short-term memory? And uh, the idea of uh, Kendall Wall at all 2018 was um, shuffle or remove contexts that are farther than some K words away, changing K, and um, if the accuracy, if the, if the predictive ability of your language model, the perplexity, right, doesn't change once you do that, it means the model wasn't actually using that context. I think this is so cool. So on the x-axis, we've got how far away from the word that you're trying to predict are you actually sort of corrupting, shuffling, or removing stuff from the, from the sequence. And then on the y-axis is the increase in loss. So if the increase in loss is zero, it means that the model was not using the thing that you just removed because if it was using it, it would now do worse without it, right? And so in, uh, if you shuffle in the blue line here, if you shuffle the history that's farther away from 50 words, the model does not even notice. I think that's really interesting. One, it says everything past 50 words of this LSTM language model you could have given it in random order and it wouldn't have noticed. Uh, and then two, it says that if you're closer than that, it actually is making use of the word order. That's a pretty long memory. Okay, that's really interesting. 
And then if you actually remove the words entirely, it, you, ha you can kind of notice that the words are missing up to 200 words away. So you don't know the order, that you don't care about the order they're in, but you care whether they're there or not. And so this is an evaluation of, well, do LSTMs have long-term memory? Well, this one at least has effectively no longer than 200 words of, me of, of memory, but also no less. So very cool. Um, so that's like a general study for a single model. It talks about uh, its, its sort of average behavior over a wide range of examples, but we want to talk about individual predictions on individual inputs. So let's talk about that. So um, one way of interpreting why did my model make this decision that's very popular is for a single example, what parts of the input actually led to the decision? Um, and this is where we come in with saliency maps. So a saliency map uh, provides a score for each word indicating its importance to the model's prediction. So you've got uh, something like uh, Bert here. You've got Bert. Bert is making a prediction for this mask. The mask rushed to the emergency room to see her patient. Okay? And so, and the predictions that the model is making is thinks with 47%, it's going to be nurse that's here in the mask uh, instead, or maybe woman, or doctor, or mother, or girl. Okay. And then the saliency map is being visualized here in orange. According to this method of saliency called simple gradients, which we'll get into, emergency, her, and the SEP token, let's not worry about the SEP token for now, but emergency and her are the important words, apparently. And the SEP token shows up in every sentence, so I'm not going to, yeah. Um, right, and so these two together are, according to this method, what's important for the model to make this prediction to mask. And you can see, you know, maybe some statistics, biases, et cetera, that is picked up in the predictions and then have it mapped out onto the sentence. And this is, well, it seems like it's really helping interpretability. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I think that this is sort of a, a very useful tool. And actually, this is part of a demo from Alan NLP uh, that allows you to do this um, uh, yourself for any sentence that you want. Um, so what's this, what's this way of making saliency maps? We're not going to go, there's, there's so many ways to do it. We're going to take a very simple one and work through why it sort of makes sense. Um, so uh, the sort of issue is how do you define importance? Right? What does it mean to be important to the model's prediction? Um, and here's one way of thinking about it. It's called the simple gradient method. Uh, let's get a little formal. You've got words x1 to xn. Okay, and then you've got a model score for a given output class. So maybe you've got, in the BERT example, each output class was each output word that you could possibly uh, predict. Um, and then you take the norm of the gradient of the score with respect to each word. Okay, so, so what we're saying here is the score right, is sort of the unnormalized probability um, for, that, for that class. Okay, so you've got a single class, you're taking the score, it's like how likely it is, not yet normalized by how likely everything else is, sort of. Um, gradient, how much is it going to change if I move it a little bit in one direction or another, and then you take the norm to get a scalar from a vector. So it looks like this. It's a salience of word i, you have the norm bars on the outside, gradient with respect to xi, so that's if I change a little bit locally xi, how much does my score change? Um, so the idea is that a high gradient norm means that if I were to change it locally, I'd affect the score a lot. And that means it was very important to the decision. Let's visualize this a little bit. So here on the y-axis, we've got loss. It's just the loss of the model. Sorry, this should be score. It should be score. And on the x-axis, you've got word space. Uh, the word space is like sort of a flattening of... <laughs> the ability to move your word embedding in thousand dimensional space. So I've just plotted it here in one dimension. Um, and now a high saliency thing, you can see that the relationship between uh, what should be score and moving the word in word space, you move it a little bit on the x-axis and the score changes a lot. That's that derivative, that's the gradient, awesome, love it. Uh, low saliency, you move the word around locally and uh, the, the score doesn't change. So that's an interpre the interpretation is that means that the actual you know, identity of this word wasn't that important to the prediction because I could have changed it and the score wouldn't have changed. 
Now, why are there more methods than this? Because I'm honestly reading that, I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. That sounds great. You know, there, there are sort of uh, lots of issues with this kind of um, uh, method and lots of ways of getting around them. Here's one issue. Um, it's not perfect uh, because, well, maybe your linear approximation that the gradient gives you holds only very, very locally. Right? So here, the gradient is zero. So this is a low saliency word because I'm at the bottom of this parabola. But if I were to move even a little bit in either direction, the score would like shoot up. Right? So is this not an important word? Like it seems important to be right there <laughs> as opposed to anywhere else even sort of nearby uh, in order for the score not to go up. So, but the, the, the simple gradients method won't capture this because it just looks at the gradient, which is that zero right there. OK, um, but uh, if you want to look into more, there's a bunch of different methods that are sort of applied in these papers. And um, you know, I think that it's a good tool for the toolbox. OK, so um, that is one way of explaining a prediction. And um, you know, it has some issues like why are individual words being scored as opposed to phrases or something like that. Um, and, but for now, we're going to move on to another type of explanation. And I'm going to check the time. OK, cool. Um, actually, yeah, let me pause for a second. Any questions about this? Uh, I mean, earlier on, there were a couple of questions. One of them was, what are your, th what are your thoughts on whether looking at attention weights is a methodologically rigorous way of determining the importance that the model places on certain tokens? It seems like there's some back and forth in the literature. That is a, <laughs> that's a great question. And I probably won't engage with that question as much as I could if we had like a second lecture on this. I actually will provide some attention analyses and tell you they're interesting. And then I'll sort of say a little bit about um, uh, you know, why they can be interesting without being sort of uh, maybe um, sort of the end all of, of analysis of, of uh, where information is flowing in a transformer, for example. Um, I think the debate is something that we would have to get into in a much longer period of time. But look at the slides that I show about attention and the caveats that I provide. And let me know if that answers your question first, because we have quite a number of slides on it. And if not, please, please ask again, and we can uh, chat more about it. And maybe you can go on. Great. OK, so um, I think this is a really fascinating question, which also gets at what was important about the input. Uh, but in actually kind of an even more direct way, which is, could I just keep some minimal part of the input and get the same answer? So here's an example from Squad. Um, you have this passage in 1899, John Jacob Astor IV invested $100,000 for Tesla. OK. Um, and then the answer that is being predicted by the model is going to always be in blue in these examples, Colorado Springs experiments. So you got this passage. And the question is, what did Tesla spend Astor's money on? That's why the prediction is Colorado Springs experiments. The model gets the uh, answer right, which is nice. And we would like to think it's because it's doing some kind of reading comprehension. Um, but here's the issue. Uh, it turns out, based on this fascinating paper, um, that if you just rec reduce the question to did, uh, you actually get exactly the same you actually get exactly the same answer. In, fa in fact, with the original question, the model had sort of a 0.78 uh, confidence you know, probability in that answer. And uh, with, the, with the reduced question did, uh, you get even higher confidence. And that, if you give a human this, they would not be able to know really what you're trying to ask about. So it seems like something is going really wonky here. Here's another. Uh, so here, here's sort of like a, a very high level overview of the method. Um, and in fact, it actually references our input sale and C methods. Ah, nice, it's connected. So, so um, you iteratively remove non-salient or unimportant words. So here's a, here's a passage again talking about uh, football, um, I think. Yeah. And, uh, and, oh, nice. OK, so the question is, where did the Broncos practice for the Super Bowl as the prediction of Stanford University? Um, and that is correct. So again, seems nice. And now we're not actually going to 
you know, get the model to be incorrect. We're just going to say, um, how can I change this question uh, such that I still get the answer right? So I'm going to remove the word that was least important according to a saliency method. So now it's where did the practice for the Super Bowl. Already this is sort of unanswerable because you've got two teams practicing. You don't even know which one you're asking about. So why the model still thinks it's so confident in Stanford University makes no sense. But you can just sort of keep going. And you know now I think here the model stops being confident in the answer of Stanford University. Uh, but you know um, uh, I think this is really interesting just to show that if the model's able to do this with very high confidence, um, it's not reflecting the uncertainty that really should be there because you can't know what you're even asking about. Okay, so what was important to make this answer? Well, at least this part, <laughs> these parts were important because you could keep just those parts and get the same answer. Fascinating. Um, all right, so that's sort of the end of the admittedly brief uh, ta section on thinking about uh, input saliency methods and similar things. Now we're going to talk about actually breaking models and understanding models by breaking them. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so if we have a passage here, Peyton Manning became the first quarterback. Um, something Super Bowl, age 39, past record held by John Elway. Uh, again, we're doing question answering. We've got a, this question, what was the name of the quarterback who was 38 in the Super Bowl? The prediction is correct. Looks good. Now we're not going to change the question to try to uh, sort of make the question nonsensical while keeping the same answer. Instead, we're going to change the passage um, by adding the sentence at the end, which really shouldn't distract anyone. This is quarterback, well-known quarterback Jeff Dean, you know, had jersey number 37 in Champ Bowl. So this just doesn't, it's really not even related. Um, but now the prediction is Jeff Dean uh, for our nice uh, QA model. Um, and so this sh shows as well that um, it seems like maybe there's this like end of the passage bias as to what you know, where the answer should be, for example. And so that's, that's, this is an adversarial example where we flipped the prediction by adding something that is innocuous to humans. And so sort of like the higher level takeaway is like, oh, it seems like the QA model that we had that seemed good is not actually performing QA how we want it to, even though it's in domain accuracy, it was good. Um, and uh, here's another example. So you've got uh, this, this paragraph uh, with a question, what has been the result of this publicity? Uh, the answer is increased scrutiny on teacher misconduct. Now, instead of changing the paragraph, we're going to change the question in really, really seemingly insignificant ways to change the model's prediction. So first, what HA, and now you've got this typo, L, been the result of this publicity? The answer changes to teacher misconduct. Likely a human would sort of ignore this typo or something and answer the right answer. And then this is really nuts. Instead of asking what has been the result of this publicity, if you ask what's been the result of this publicity, the answer also changes. And this is, the, the authors call this a semantically equivalent adversary. Uh, this is pretty rough, <laughs> and in general, uh, swapping what for what in this QA model breaks it pretty frequently. Um, and so again, when you go back and sort of re-tinker how to build your model, uh, you're going to be thinking about these things, not just the sort of average accuracy. Um, so uh, that's sort of talking about noise. Our models robust to noise in their inputs? Uh, are humans robust to noise is another question we can ask. And so you can kind of go to this popular uh, sort of meme passed around the internet from time to time where you have all the letters in these words scrambled. You say, according to a research uh, uh, at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are, right? And so it seems like, you know, I think I did a pretty good job there. Uh, seemingly, right, we got this noise that's a specific kind of noise. And we can be robust as humans to reading and processing the language without actually all that much of a, of a difficulty. Um, so that's maybe something that we might want our models to also be robust to. Um, and uh, it's, it's very practical as well. Noise is a part of all NLP systems uh, inputs at all times. Um, there's just no such thing effectively as having you know, users, for example, and not having any noise. 
Um, and so there's a study that was performed on some you know, popular machine translation models where uh, you train machine translation models, uh, French, uh, German, and Czech, I think all to English. And you get blue scores. These blue scores will look a lot better than the ones in your assignment four because much, much more training data. The idea is these are actually pretty strong uh, machine translation systems. Uh, and that's an in in-domain clean text. Now, if you add character swaps, like the ones we saw in, you know, in, that, uh, in that sentence about Cambridge, um, the blue scores take a pretty harsh dive. Not very good. Um, and even if you take somewhat a somewhat more natural sort of typo noise distribution here, you'll see that you're still getting, you know, 20-ish, uh, yeah, very high uh, drops in blue score through simply natural noise. And so maybe you'll go back and retrain the model on more types of noise, and then you ask, oh, if I do that, is it robust to even different kinds of noise? These are the questions that are going to be really important, and it's important to know that you're able to break your model really easily so that you can then go and try to make it more robust. Okay, um, now, let's see, 20 minutes, awesome. Uh, now we're going to, I guess, yeah, yeah. So now we're going to look at the representations of our neural networks. Um, we've talked about sort of their behavior and then whether we could sort of change or, or observe reasons behind their behavior. Now we'll go into less abstraction, look more at the actual vector representations that are being built by models, and we can answer a different kind of question, um, at the very least, than with the other studies. Um, the first thing is related to the uh, question that was asked about attention, which is that um, some modeling components lend themselves to inspection. Now, this is a sentence that I chose somewhat carefully, actually because in part of this debate, right, are they interpretable components? We'll see, but they lend themselves to inspection in the following way. You can visualize them well, and you can correlate them easily with various properties. Um, so let's say you have attention heads in BERT. This is from a really uh, nice study that was done here, um, where uh, you look at attention heads of BERT and you say, uh, you know, on most sentences, this attention head, head 1, 1, seems to do this very sort of global aggregation. Simple kind of operation, does this pretty consistently. That's cool. Um, is it interpretable? Well, Maybe, right? So it's the first layer, which means that this word found is sort of uncontextualized. And then, um, you know, but in deeper layers, the problem is that, like, once you do some rounds of attention, you've had information mixing and flowing between words. And how do you know exactly what information you're combining, what you're attending to even? It's a little hard to tell. Um, and uh, saliency methods more directly sort of evaluate the importance of models. But it's still interesting to see, at sort of a local mechanistic point of view, what kinds of things are being attended to. So, so let's take another example. Uh, some attention heads seem to perform simple operations. So you have the global aggregation here that we saw already. Others seem to attend pretty robustly to the next token. Cool, next token is a great signal. Some heads attend to the SEP token. Uh, so here you have attending to SEP, and then maybe some attend to periods. Maybe that's sort of a, you know, splitting sentences together and things like that. Not things that are hard to do, but things that some attention heads seem to pretty robustly perform. Um, again now, though, deep in the network, what's actually represented at this period at layer 11? A little unclear. A little unclear. Okay. Um, so... Uh, some heads, though, are correlated with really interesting linguistic properties. So this head is actually attending to noun modifiers. So you've got this the complicated language in the huge new law, um, right? That's pretty fascinating. Um, even if the model is not like doing this as a causal mechanism to do syntax necessarily, the fact that these things so strongly correlate is actually pretty, pretty cool. And so what we have in all of these studies is we've got sort of an approximate interpretation and quantitative analysis relating, uh, like allowing us to reason about very complicated model behavior. They're all approximations, but they're, they're definitely interesting. Uh, one other example is that of co-reference. So we saw some work on co-reference, 
And um, it seems like this head does a pretty OK job of actually matching up co-referent entities. These are in red. Talks, negotiations, she, her. And that's not obvious how to do that. And this is a difficult task. And so it does so you know, with some percentage of the time. Um, and again, it's sort of connecting very complex model behavior to, uh, to these sort of interpretable summaries of correlating uh, properties. Um, other th cases, you can have individual hidden units that lend themselves to interpretation. So uh, here, you've got a character level LSTM language model. Each row here is a sentence. If you can't read it, that's totally OK. The interpretation that you should take is that as we walk along the sentence, this single unit is going from, I think, very negative to very positive, or very positive to very negative. I don't really remember. Um, but it's you know, tracking the position in the line. So it's just a linear position unit, and uh, pretty robustly doing so across all of these sentences. So this is from a nice visualization study way back in 2016, way back. Um, here's another cell from that same LSTM language model that seems to sort of turn on inside quotes. So here's a quote, and then it turns on. OK, so I guess that's positive in the blue. End quote here, and then it's negative. Here you start with no quote, negative in the red, see a quote, and then blue. Seems, again, very interpretable. Also, potentially a very useful feature to keep in mind. And this is just an individual unit in the LSTM that you can just look at and see that it does this. Very, very interesting. Um, uh, even farther on this, and this is actually a study by some um, AI and neuroscience researchers, is we saw the LSTMs were good at subject-verb number agreement. Um, can we figure out the mechanisms by which the LSTM is solving the task? Can we actually get some insight into that? And so we have a word-level language model. And the word-level language model is going to be a little small, but you have a sentence, the boy gently and kindly greets the. And this cell that's being tracked here, so it's an individual hidden unit, um, one dimension, right, uh, is actually, after it sees boy, it sort of starts to go higher, and then it goes down to something very small once it sees greets. And this cell seems to correlate with the scope of a subject verb number agreement uh, instance, effectively. So here, the boy that watches the dog that watches the cat greets. You've got that cell, again, staying high, maintaining the scope of subject until greets, and at which point it stops. What allows it to do that? Probably some complex other <laughs> dynamics in the network, but it's still a fascinating, I think, insight. Um, and yeah, this is just you know neuron uh, <laughs> 1,150 in this LSTM. Uh, now, uh, so those are sort of all observational studies that you could do by picking out individual components of the model that you can sort of just take each one of and um, correlating them with some behavior. Now, we'll look at a general class of methods called probing, by which we still sort of use supervised knowledge, like the knowledge of the type of co-reference that we're looking for. But instead of seeing if it correlates with something that's immediately interpretable, like a attention head, we're going to look into the vector representations of the model and see if these properties can be read out by some simple function. Uh, to say, oh, maybe this property was made very easily accessible by my neural network. So let's dig into this. Um, so the general paradigm is that you've got language data uh, that goes into some big pre-trained <laughs> transformer with fine tuning, and you get state-of-the-art results. Uh, soda means state-of-the-art, right? And so the question for the probing sort of methodology is like, if it's providing these general purpose language representations, you know, what does it actually encode about language? Like, can we, can we quantify this? Can we figure out what kinds of things it's learning about language that we seemingly now don't have to tell it? And um, so you might have something like a sentence, like I record the record. That's an interesting sentence. And you put it into your, your transformer model with its word embeddings at the, be, at the uh, beginning, maybe some layers of self-attention and stuff, and you make some predictions. And now our objects of study are going to be these intermediate layers. Right? So it's a vector per word or subword uh, for every layer. 
And the question is, like, can we use these linguistic properties like the dependency parsing that we had way back in the early part of the course um, to understand uh, sort of correlations between um, properties in the vectors and these things that we can interpret. We can interpret dependency parses. Um, so, so there are a couple of things that we might want to look for here. Uh, you might want to look for semantics. So here in the sentence, I record the record, uh, I am an agent. That's a semantics thing. Uh, record is a patient. It's the thing I'm recording. Okay. You might have syntax. So you might have this syntax tree that you're interested in. That's the dependency parse tree. Uh, maybe you're interested in part of speech, right? Because you have record uh, and record. And uh, the first one's a verb. The second one's a noun. They're identical strings. Does the model sort of encode that one is one and the other is the other? Um, so how do we do this kind of study? Um, so we're going to decide on a layer that we want to analyze. And we're going to freeze BERT. So we're not going to fine tune BERT. All the parameters are frozen. So we're going to decide on layer two of BERT. And we're going to pass it some sentences. We decide on, a, on a, what's called a probe family. And the question I'm asking is, can I use a model from my family, say linear, to decode a property that I'm interested in really well from this layer. So it's indicating that this property is easily accessible to linear models effectively. So maybe I get, I train a model, I train a linear classifier right on top of BERT, and I get a really high accuracy. And that's sort of interesting already because you know from prior work in part of speech tagging that if you run a linear classifier on simpler features that aren't BERT, you probably don't get as high an accuracy. So that's an interesting sort of takeaway. But then you can also take like a baseline. So I want to compare two layers now. So I've got layer one here. I want to compare it to layer two. I train a probe on it as well. Maybe the accuracy isn't as good. And now I can say, oh, wow, look, by layer two, part of speech is more easily accessible to linear functions than it was at layer one. So what did that? Well, the self-attention and feed-forward stuff made it more easily accessible. That's interesting because it's a statement about sort of the information processing of the model. OK. OK, so that's how we're going to analyze these layers. Um, let's take a second more to think about it. And just really, give me just a second. Um, <laughs> so if you have the model's representations h1 to ht, uh, and you have a function family f, that's the subset linear models, or maybe you have like a feed-forward neural network, some fixed set of hyperparameters, freeze the model, train the probe, so you get some predictions for part of speech tagging or whatever. That's just the probe uh, applied to the hidden state of the model. The probe is a member of the probe family. And then the extent that we can predict y is a measure of accessibility. So that's just kind of written out, not as pictorially. OK. So I'm not going not gonna to stay on this for too much longer. Um, and uh, you know, it may help in the search for causal mechanisms. Um, but it sort of just gives us a rough understanding of sort of processing of the model and what things are accessible at what layer. Um, so what are some results here? So one result is that uh, BERT, if you run linear probes on it, does really, really well on things that require syntax and part of speech named entity recognition. Actually, in some cases, approximately as well as just doing the very best thing you could possibly do uh, without <laughs> without BERT. So it just makes easily accessible amazingly strong features for these properties. And that's an interesting sort of emergent quality of BERT, you might say. Um, it seems like as well that the layers of BERT have this property where, so if you look at the columns of this, of this uh, plot here, each column is a task. You've got input words at the sort of layer 0 of BERT here. Layer 24 is the last layer of BERT large. Lower performance is yellow, higher performance is blue, and I, the resolution isn't perfect. But consistently, the best place to read out these properties is somewhere a bit past the middle of the model, uh, which is just, it's this very consistent rule, which is fascinating. Um, and then it seems as well like uh, if you look at this function of increasingly abstract or increasingly difficult to compute linguistic properties on this axis and increasing depth in the network on that axis, so the deeper you go in the network, it seems like the more easily you can uh, access more and more abstract linguistic properties, suggesting that 
that accessibility is being constructed over time by the layers of processing of BERT. So it's building more and more abstract features, which I think is, again, sort of a really interesting result. Um, and now I think, yeah, one thing that I think comes to mind uh, that really brings us back right to day one is um, we built intuitions around word to vec we were asking, like, what does each dimension of word to vec mean? And the answer was, ah, not really, not really anything. But we could build intuitions about it and think about properties of it through sort of these connections between simple mathematical properties of word to vec and linguistic properties that we could sort of understand. So we had this approximation, which is not 100% not true, but it's an approximation that says cosine similarity uh, <clears throat> is effectively correlated with semantic similarity. Think about even if all we're going to do at the end of the day is fine tune these word embeddings anyway. Um, likewise, we had this sort of idea about the analogies being encoded by linear offsets. So some relationships are linear in space, and they didn't have to be. That's fascinating. It's this emergent property that we've now been able to study since we discovered this. Why is that the case in word to vec And in general, even though you can't interpret the individual dimensions of, of word to vec um, these sort of emergent, interpretable connections between approximate linguistic ideas and sort of simple math on these objects is fascinating. And so one piece of work that sort of extends this idea um, comes back to dependency parse trees. So they describe the syntax of sentences. Um, and in a paper uh, that I did with, uh, with Chris, um, we showed that actually BERT and models like it uh, make dependency parse tree structure emergent, uh, sort of more easily accessible than one might imagine in its vector space. So if you've got a tree right here, the chef who ran to the store was out of food, uh, what you can sort of do is think about the tree in terms of distances between words. So you've got the number of edges in the tree uh, between two words is their path distance. So you've got sort of that the distance between chef and was is one. And we're going to use this interpretation of a tree as a distance to make a connection with Bert's embedding space. And what we were able to show is that under a single linear transformation, um, the squared Euclidean distance between Bert vectors for the same sentence actually correlates well, if you choose the B matrix right, uh, with the distances in the tree. So here, in this Euclidean space that we've transformed, um, the approximate distance between chef and was is also one. Likewise, the difference between was and store is four in the tree. And in my simple sort of tr transformation of BERT space, the distance between store and was is also approximately four. And this is true across a wide range of sentences. And this is, like, a, to me, a fascinating uh, example of, again, emergent approximate structure in these very nonlinear models that don't necessarily need to encode things so simply. OK. All right. Great. So um, probing studies and correlation studies are, I think, interesting and point us in directions to build intuitions about models. Um, but they're not arguments that the model is actually using the thing that you're finding to make a decision. They're not causal studies. Um, this is for probing and correlation studies. So in some work that I did uh, uh, around the same time, we showed actually that certain conditions on probes allow you to achieve high accuracy on a task that's effectively just fitting random labels. And so there's a difficulty of, an inter of interpret interpreting what the model could or could not be doing with this thing that is somehow easily accessible. It's interesting that this property is easily accessible, but the model might not be doing anything with it, for example, because it's totally random. Um, likewise, another paper showed that you can achieve high accuracy with a probe, even if the model is trained to know that thing that you're probing for is not useful. Um, and there's causal studies that sort of try to extend this work. It's much more difficult, but read this paper, and it's a fascinating line of future work. Now, in my last you know, two minutes, um, I want to talk about recasting model tweaks and ablations as analysis. Um, so we had this improvement process where we had a network that was going to work OK. And we would see whether we could tweak it in simple ways to improve it. And then you could see whether you could remove anything and have it still be OK. And that's kind of like analysis. Like, I have my network. Do I want it to, like, 
Is it going to be better if it's more complicated? If it's going to be better if it's simpler? Can I get away with it being simpler? And so one example of uh, some folks who did this is they, they took this idea of multi-headed attention and said, ah, so many heads. Are all the heads important? And what they showed is that if you train a system with multi-headed attention and then just remove the heads at test time and not use them at all, you can actually do pretty well on the original task, not retraining at all, without some of the attention heads, showing that they weren't important. You could just get rid of them after training. And likewise, you can do the same thing for, this is on machine translation, this is on multi-NLI. You can actually get away without a large, large percentage of your attention heads. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so um, another thing that you could think about is questioning sort of the, the basics of the models that we're building. So we have transformer models that are sort of self-attention, feed-forward, self-attention, feed-forward. But like, why in that order, with some of the things omitted here, and the, uh, this paper asked this question and said, if this is my transformer, self-attention, feed-forward, self-attention, feed-forward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, what if I just reordered it so that I had a bunch of self-attentions at, at the head and a bunch of feed-forwards at the back, and they tried a bunch of these orderings, and this one actually does uh, better. So this achieves a, a lower perplexity on a benchmark. And this is a way of analyzing what's important about the architectures that I'm building and how can they be changed in order to perform better. So neural models are very complex, and they're difficult to characterize and impossible to characterize with a single sort of statistic, I think, for your test set accuracy, especially in domain. Um, and we want to find intuitive descriptions of model behaviors, but we should look at multiple levels of, of abstraction, and none of them are going to be complete. When someone tells you that their neural network is interpretable, I encourage you to engage critically with that. It's not necessarily false but like the levels of interpretability and what you can interpret, these are the questions that you should be asking because it's going to be opaque in some ways, almost definitely. Um, and then you know, bring this, sort of, uh, this, this, this lens to your model building as you try to think about how to build better models, even if you're not going to be doing analysis as sort of one of your main driving goals. Uh, and with that, you know, good luck on your final projects. I realize we're at time. Um, the teaching staff is really appreciative of of your efforts um, over this difficult quarter. And uh, yeah, hope, um, yeah, I guess there's, there's a lecture left on Thursday. But yeah, um, this is my last one. So thanks, everyone.